Greetings, everyone. My name is Karina, and I'm glad to open our Scale West webinar. Our Our speaker today is David Lottenbeck. He's a business model wizard, angel investor, business school professor, and European Bank of Reconstruction and Development advisor for Ukrainian information and communication technologies. Today, David will share with you his practical experience with Ukrainian scale-ups uh, that succeeded in the challenging process of gaining global traction. He will also cover the opportunity for Ukrainian information and communication technology scale-ups to receive free professional advisory from European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. So, David, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. So, first thing I will do is share my screen. I have a few uh, slides I would like uh, to share uh, with you. So, let's go right uh, into uh, the matter. Um, and so the, the idea of, of our uh, mini webinar is to look uh, at the success factors and hacks how Ukrainian ICT startups, scale-ups, can gain traction globally by not wasting time, by not make, making uh, mistakes that are too, uh, too big, learning from those who already uh, made it. And for that, we have invited um, three um, panelists. Uh, Vadim, who we hope uh, will join us very uh, short, uh, shortly. Val, who's already uh, there. Alexei, who promised to be in five uh, to 10 minutes. Um, Vadim Rogovsky is the founder of 3D Look Me. That's an AI application for the fashion uh, industry is scaling his company uh, in the US very uh, successfully. Then we have Val uh, Grabko, founder of PromoRepublic.com, uh, on his way almost to uh, the US, to uh, Las Vegas, to be more precise, um, on a conference where uh, his uh, product will shine again. Um, Promo Republic uh, makes uh, over 90% of its sales uh, in the US, um, scaling uh, success uh, story that is to be continued. And uh, the third panelist, uh, Alexei, uh, is founder of uh, Yespo and uh, Retaino. Uh, these are uh, MarTech uh, applications that are um, in um, the uh, field of uh, customer data platforms and um, automatic messaging. Um, three um, successful founders to whom I will present my five uh, theses. So um, let me first make a, a decent uh, uh, introduction to uh, the location, the virtual location where this is all, uh, all taking uh, place. Uh, back, uh, back, uh, back in, in, in Kiev. Where this is our target uh, audience. So I'm greeting uh, Ukraine, I'm greeting uh, Kiev, and I say uh, Kiev is still standing. All right, special day today. I'm aware of that. So let's uh, move uh, into my observations with these three companies that I have accompanied or I'm still accompanying in their uh, global scaling uh, challenge. I have some others that I'm also uh, helping, advising through uh, EPRD or in other, uh, in other ways. And so over the years, I've accumulated uh, a lot of impressions, a lot of success stories, also mistakes that happened uh, and out of that, uh, I have come to findings, to, to, to learnings um, that I would like to synthesize uh, in, five, uh, in five theses. These five theses that you can see uh, on the screen uh, here. And I would like to uh, start with uh, the one that I think is uh, the most important uh, element, and that's to make it in the toughest market or you won't make it ever. And 
For that, I would like to uh, call a uh, call on history and Val uh, probably recognizes this shot. This was actually from a, a conference we did together, uh, internal conference in, in Prama Republic. How many years ago is, was that Val? Five years ago, six years ago? Yeah, I think so. I think it was like five. Yeah, it was like like five uh, five years ago, and uh, I took this picture because at that time I think uh, the, the decision was uh, not only made but uh, but actually already implemented to focus on one um, global market uh, that um, the U.S. global market. Uh, that I, I hear an, e an echo here, so maybe the technical guys can fix that a bit. Um, so, um, what is what is the what is the conclusion? Uh, what is the uh, finding that we had? And I will ask Valentin to to make his comments uh, on that. So, the conclusion is that um, the best idea is to target first only the toughest, most mature, and most promising markets. So, um, and I remember uh, the Promo Republic uh, situation. Uh, the very original uh, phase of the company, uh, it started the Ukrainian market and the Russian-speaking uh, market. And clearly, uh, after 2014, um, that had uh, to change. And the discussion was, shall we go to easier markets? Shall we go to close, geographically close markets? Should we uh, start in Germany? Should we uh, start expanding in the UK? Or should we go... To the toughest and uh, biggest market, and um, my belief now over or, over the time is that uh, you have to pick the toughest and and, and most promising market right from the uh, first moment, because uh, this is where you want to prove your product market fit. Uh, if you make it. There, if you make it as an example in the US, chances are you will make it everywhere. And it's much, much easier to replicate uh, the, the success that you've made in a, uh, in a, in a tough market and, and, and go into uh, other uh, markets than the other way around. The gradualist path, I think, is a waste of time, a waste of uh, investor uh, money. Val, maybe you can. Um, Add to this uh, your experience, how you, uh, together with the Promo Republic team, thought about where to focus geographically in the beginning and what your thoughts are now where you are clearly uh, successfully focused on the U.S. market. Val, please. Yeah, sure, Dave. Yeah, thanks for this introduction. Uh, yeah, I think Chris thought, uh, like was made before, actually, when we entered market. I'm not so happy. <laughs> it was really tough, <laughs> I can say. Um, but just to like to add to your point and to tell our story is it's like it's it's mostly I guess for Ukrainian companies is like either is like local market or it's some uh, foreign market, right? And it could be like Europe or it could be Asia or it could be US. Uh, and I can say that. U.S. actually to sell software, to sell B2B enterprise software is maybe the easiest actually than uh, any any market, right? So it's 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 could be perceived like as a really tough and uh, you need to know, I don't know, like the culture, the language, the processes, right? But in the same, at the same time, it's like they have everything. They already kind of buy in Salesforce uh, for decades, right? So they buy in a lot of SaaS, B2B enterprise software. Mm -hmm. They they like innovation. They uh, early adopters, right? So th that's why it's actually if like you know to flip that it's it's the easiest market for the software entrepreneurs. Um, but if to go to details, of course, we spend a lot of time, like and you know that. Uh, on the hiring people, right? Because without U.S. people, it, uh, just it's really slow to do that ourselves uh, from Ukraine or even from Finland, where we established the company. 
right? Mm-hmm. That's why I think the breakthrough was like when we start traveling there, start going to the conferences and start hiring people, right? At least like one, two uh, kind of managers who is really accelerating the culture and giving uh, idea like how the buying process looks like and how to communicate and how to kind of close the deal, how on board, how uh, scale like the account if you, if you talk, right? So the whole account management itself. So yeah, so this is the the, the one of the breakthroughs uh, like hiring people. This is my, I think it's my number one recommendation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Karina, do we have any of the other panelists on stream already? Can we ask them the question or are they not yet there? Uh, yes, Vadim has actually joined us. So I believe Perfect. he has three, three questions. Okay. Vadim, hello. Uh, welcome to, uh, to the show here. Thank you for, for making it, for making it possible. So we are, <laughs> we are in the, the first uh, thesis um, market uh, selection, and I think Val brought it across very nicely. Uh, U.S. is a tough market for sure, but it's also an open uh, an open market, open for uh, for uh, innovations, open for products that come from unknown uh, geographies. What is the what was your um, decision? Uh, to 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 focus on on initial on initial market. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks David for having me here. Uh, sorry that, that I'm late. I just was a uh, uh, I think uh, like a, a, a going through a driving license exam here in New York, and it, it, it was unpredictable. It took much more time than I expected. So uh, I I mean I definitely agree with uh, what just Val said and definitely um, I mean it's a great market to te- test uh, and not even to test it's the, the market where you can prove that your that your software really delivers value and, and then the rest of the world I mean they will also kind of they will also em- em- they will also embrace it because Europe and Asia. And the corporations they are they 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 watch they watch their U.S. counterparts and U.S. competitors very closely, and if they see that something works, they they go and implement it in their markets, right? So this is a good market to start from. However, it also has certain, I would say, have huge challenges, right? And because it's a very competitive, obviously very expensive market, uh, and, and uh, I think ninety plus percent of the companies and startups who try to enter it, they just don't make it. And I think one of the problems, one of the main reasons why they don't make it is because they lack commitment. They might be still, I mean, if they try to do it without, in the, and none of the founders is located in the U.S., uh, or at least spends there, I don't know, half of his time. It just wouldn't work. I mean, and I, and, uh, I, I mean, there are like, <laughs> yeah huge number of examples that prove it of people I know. And as soon as people move there, of course, it's not, it's, I mean, they don't see changes immediately. But when you move there, you start to understand people, how they make decisions, how they act. You start to get your to build community around you to build network that helps you with recruiting. And I agree that recruiting, yeah, to make it fast, to make it with the higher quality, it is really what differentiates slow growing startups from fast growing startups from the very, very early stages, even when, when you are five people and you cannot, and you are not hiring anyone and you stay five or eight people for years, you just won't make it. It's clear, but so you need to, to work on your hiring function. So yeah, just long story short. So, I mean, it's definitely about, it's a great market to start. However, you need to understand all the limitations, all the challenges, be prepared for it and have a commitment for let's say five years, at least commitment to this market only, and then you have higher chances to, to succeed. Okay, super, Vadim. So you, you confirm uh, the thesis, uh, uh, make it, well, maybe not in the toughest market, but make it in a uh, in a market that you committed, uh, that, that you're committing on, uh, focus on uh, on that one. Uh, don't take the easiest way, uh, take, take uh, an advanced uh, market. Uh, like the U.S., uh, maybe not in all cases it will be the U.S., but it will be an advanced, growing, and open uh, market. And um, if you make it in that big 
challenging market, chances are you will make it everywhere. So yes. I think uh, you confirm, uh, like Val, that this is uh, the way uh, to go. Think a bit big, uh, commit, uh, commit completely also on the timeline, um, have your investors uh, behind you, uh, make sure you have the money to, to, to do uh, all that. Uh, and uh, take it, take it from there. Super. Let's go. To, let's move to the second uh, thesis. Um, did I formulate? Oh, it's a bit difficult to be here. Maybe I'll go um, on that. Oh, screen sharing has stopped. Uh huh. So I'll go back, back on the screen sharing. Sorry for that, folks. But I'll yeah, keep... by the way, I see Alexei yeah. from Jesper joined as well. Oh, Alexei, welcome. Thank you that you Hi. can make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Sorry for being late. No, 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 you're not late. Nobody's late here. <laughs> Those who don't make it in the market are late, but not uh, people that don't make it on the call. Second, the second uh, thesis that I would like to discuss uh, with, with the panelists um, is uh, the focus on functionalities or focus on capabilities of your service uh, or your uh, product. So <clears throat> the observation uh, I, I've made, and uh, I'll ask uh, Alexei afterwards to bring up his, his opinion or his experience. Uh, I think um, if you want to make it in uh, in a committed, uh, tough market like, like, uh, like uh, the U.S., but then uh, you, you will not make it with a big uh, machine with a big uh, product that might be oiled in some parts and less oiled in others, but rather uh, you focus on some uh, differentiated core capabilities where you can uh, compete in, in your uh, in your focus uh, market. Start small or, or, or narrow in your uh, in your promise in your uh, value proposition uh, to the customer, but fulfill it uh, in a maximum way and in a way that you can really scale. And I think the, the connection between having a, an easy uh, product, a focused, narrow uh, product and being able uh, to scale it uh, is, a, is, a, is a clear, is a clear, uh, a clear correlation. Um, scale have, having the scalable part of, of your uh, product uh, enter the focus market is uh, is, is an absolute uh, absolute must if you if your product has a, an onboarding that is uh, that is costly that is time uh, consuming that has a high cost for the customer and for yourself well then uh, you, you can't you can't really scale it uh, if if you uh, have a product that needs a lot of uh, service, that's also a bummer uh, regarding uh, scalability. So the message uh, is clear: uh, focus on, on on the core capability that you can scale uh, out uh, in the market. So Alex, what is what is your uh, experience with uh, with Retainer, which I see as a typical uh, product that is very very uh, focused and very scalable. Yes, uh, thanks, David, for having me here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining this day, this call. So, yeah, uh, for us, uh, it was actually one of the most, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know, most uh, prominent changes in our perception of a business. Uh, some uh, people here know us as a uh, Sputnik uh, marketing automation service from uh, Alexei, we lost Alexei for for uh, for a moment. Let's see if he gets well, back. Six percent of uh, top e-commerce market. Okay, excuse me. Yes, yeah, so uh, Alexei, you I, we lost you for, I guess for I'm a, still for here. A yeah, so maybe you can get to a oh, okay. more better okay. connected place. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so you yeah, you so, stop. Um, okay. Right. So we had uh, an enterprise level company with lots of features and, uh, you know, gradually we were uh, acquiring more and more 
features, uh, even uh, acquiring some startups uh, and digesting and blending in one more uh, efficient, as we saw, product. And it was super for uh, enterprise market in Ukraine, but when we understood that one, okay, we want to try to multiply its results in several markets, it happens to be impossible. And uh, the way we approached this problem, we understood, okay, we have overcomplicated products. So let's uh, just uh, take one, uh, one feature and separate it as a product. And that's how the Stripo uh, can you explain to people that our, who, do, who might not know what Stripe is, what Stripe does? Uh, Stripe is uh, an online email template editor. So just one small feature of a huge marketing automation uh, platform uh, that uh, like probably it's like three or five percent of all the complexity of a product. Mm. Uh, but it was very uh, targeted on solving just one problem. So how to design online email templates that would fit to any other sending uh, sending machine. So whichever you use MailChimp or SendGrid, you can use templates from Stripe. And uh, that's how gradually it became uh, number one online uh, email editing tool in the world today. Oh, yeah. What's the growth that you attained with, through this strategy? The yearly growth? Uh, uh, well, we grew... Uh, and keep growing uh, about uh, 2.5 times per year and uh, currently have more than a half million uh, users across the globe. Uh, and uh, that was like an approach that we, after that repeated uh, by now uh, two times more. Uh, so currently on the market, there is a solution, special solution for marketing automation for uh, mobile applications, the retina you mentioned before, and it's focused solely on uh, mobile applications that want to automate all the communications within any channel. Again, it's like 30% uh, of uh, Sputnik functionality, but specially tailored for a spe specific audience. And the same way we uh, released this year, uh, Claspo as a solution for uh, engagement of web uh, visitors of the website. Again, uh, it used to be a part of Sputnik, but now it it's developed by a separate team. It uh, has separate uh, balance sheets, separate uh, marketing budget, and uh, and all those things. And it's still uh, is reused within Sputnik, but again, works for a specific uh, problem and uh, for specific audience. Yeah, and, and so very low entry cost for the customer and highly scalable uh, for uh, for you. Um, probably no or, or very limited onboarding and no service uh, on the uh, on the back end. Uh, okay, very, very interesting. Uh, Vadim, uh, let me ask you, um, would you would you agree with this second thesis? Are you applying it uh, with 3D look? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, in our case, we started from, uh, yeah, we started from enterprise. We went after big, big retailers and uh, uniform manufacturers in the U.S. And we still work with one of the largest body armor manufacturer in the in the world, for example. They uh, provide our solutions to to policemen, for example, in the U.S. And if policemen wants to get a, a, a body armor. He just uses his smartphone, takes two photos of him, and he, then he gets his body armor that is ideally, you know, um, ideally fits his body, right? So, and so we started from these kind of kinds of companies because I just had B2B enterprise experience in my previous company, so it was just natural step for me. And uh, but then, but then we decided to go to mid market. And we delivered, we deployed the solution for um, medium-sized e-commerce, like fashion okay. e-commerce businesses sitting on Shopify, etc. In order to scale it mm -hmm. faster, but still, it's too early to say if it was the right move or not, because enterprise it's super slow, it's less predictable because you can your sales cycles can take years, and it's hard even to measure your marketing ROI. But however. With enterprises, you get a lot of validation, a lot of data that you can then mm -hmm. receive so investment the right from them. Strategy, 
Yeah, so then you have pros and cons in both approaches, and and I think what really matters is the DNA of the company, DNA of the team. Some some founders they prefer to launch products for millions of SMBs or just individual users. Some founders just love delivering stuff for enterprises. I I think it all goes back to the DNA. Yeah. Okay, but would you agree that the, to the thesis that uh, the success that you're having so uh, so far is also due that you narrowed down your functionality and made sure this was really differentiated and scalable? Do you agree to, to this? Yeah, I mean, of course, this is kind of uh, SaaS okay. 101. I mean, that's of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, Val, maybe you, you have something to to comment. Val Grabko. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's like like uh, you guys said a lot about that. Uh, and you, you know, like I, I'm really big fan of like find the niche, right? And uh, focus there. And uh, I think it's crucial for uh, a lot of SaaS markets are commodity now, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you, you can just build like another one, uh, CRM or email system or like something else, right? You need to differentiate yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this is the only way how, again, I'm really into B2B enterprise SaaS. So you, you need to uh, find the ways how to differentiate, differentiate there. And then B2C, of course, it's even, I think, more possibilities to do, to find mm -hmm. a specific segment, underserved segment that you need to, uh, yeah. that you can cover with your Capabilities and it's a lot of actually like hard decisions, right? To do like to make like to make decision of what not to do. Exactly. Uh, so this is no, this gets things. us exactly well. So this I think gets us to the next to the next uh, thesis, right? So. Uh, yeah, so David, I will just ask you to reconnect with the full screen. Okay, pleasure. Mm -hmm. I see. If I manage that, I should manage that. So go to full screen. Uh -huh. Okay, full screen. Amazing. Can you see that? Okay, so I'll just move this somewhere. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, yeah. So this, I guess, leads us to to, to, to the next thesis. So when I uh, observe all, all you know, you three panel companies, but uh, others, of, of course, I see that um, you still are even four, five, six years uh, in, uh, in the life of the company, you're, you're still pivoting uh, somewhat. You're, you're not pivoting regarding uh, the, uh, the core capability uh, or um, the key value proposition, but you're, you're, you're pivoting about, you know, should I go to, uh, to, should I go to enterprise? To what degree should I go to uh, enterprise? Uh, is there is there some other underserved uh, segment that we can uh, we can enter? Um, it is uh, it is a, a game from that you play from a strength. Uh, you already have uh, an initial success uh, story. Uh, so Vadim, you yours uh, was or is in the in, 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 in the, the the enterprise uh, the in, in, in the public sector with, with with the police. Then you move into the uh, private sector and. You might find a solution for smaller businesses as well. I, I think you even have that. Um, so, um, what I would be interested to hear: how how costly uh, are these pivots in the uh, in, in the phase that that, that you that you are? Are these uh, pivots that? cost you a lot of money, a lot of time, and, and are uh, corrections that you could have avoided? Or is this part of, of the process of, of getting better uh, and better? Vadim, what are your thoughts on, on the pivoting? Vadim, uh, do we... Yes. Yeah, 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 David, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just getting from the text. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree with this notion too that you need to be ready to pivot. Uh, not, not a bit. I mean, probably pivot is too radical. I think you just need to be ready to um, constantly, like, to to understand your core, but a uh, core market, but and uh, core prop, core value prop. But at the same time, always be testing different markets, different solutions. So spend at least like twenty percent of time on experiments 
because as Val said, there is a lot of commoditization on the markets and different markets have different levels of competitions, different different velocity and different um, opportunity windows. So yes, I mean, not probably pivoting, but definitely experimenting, testing, and trying to find uh, other markets that you can uh, penetrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alex Dranchenko, your your comment. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree that you have to be ready to change and to change your perception of uh, of the value. Uh, and uh, how to negotiate and how to bring the value in the proper way, uh, but uh, uh, but still some some things have to be uh, stay in the core. If you say core, what, yeah. yeah, and what stays uh, is actually the problem. Uh, the problem is that you are addressing. Uh, you can play around how exactly you fix the problem and how do you explain people that is the best way to fix their problem. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, one of uh, the main drivers for us uh, in improving the products and creating new products uh, in our ecosystem is uh, bringing the professional uh, marketing, marketing to the people. And uh, everything we do is built around this uh, approach, like democratizing uh, marketing tools. So yeah, but, but we constantly change everything around this slogan. Yeah, so that's the only constant thing is that you constantly are changing and fine tuning your your value proposition and your and your product. Let's move to to the, uh, the fourth and the second last uh, um, thesis, um, and uh, I call I call it the the land and expand. Uh, aspect and it has to do about geographical markets but it also has to do about uh, about segments the observation i i made is um, like like we said in the first uh, thesis you have to make a commitment on your on your landing market on your first market that that you uh, want to land be it geographical or or uh, or, or a customer uh, a customer segment um and Take it then from there, from a position, from a position uh, of of of, uh, of strength, and expand it in, in very uh, in very different ways. Uh, in, in, in Promo Republic, I'm always fascinated to to see how uh, an initial uh, contract with a with a fra with a franchise uh, company or um, a local market uh, company, how that initial contract, if managed well can expand many times uh many times over and i think vadim you, you know you told me about some of those fashion uh, groups where you land maybe in one brand and prove your uh your products uh capabilities and then you you, you get it into other brands of that uh, of that uh, same group or uh, you get it into uh, other uh, other uh, geographies um so uh, to attack customers that you can develop, that give you uh, recurring uh, revenue, that give you a high degree uh, of loyalty, I have observed that this is an absolute uh, an absolute key. Let me ask you there, therefore, Val, uh, as, as the first uh, partner, what his observations are regarding um, recurring revenue, making sure that recurring revenue is really uh, recurring and that initial landings can be expanded well wow. yeah and is david um yeah again it's i think because i'm a big fan of b2b enterprise it's it's a big part of any uh kind of sell cycle right so you're going you win this account you win this company and uh because for example we are in a digital marketing tool space Right, so we we provide you with different marketing tools, right, and um, we and we can sell you different tools like during the lifetime uh, that we are cooperating with with a customer, right, um, and like to what you mentioned about, for example, choosing the customers, and uh, they usually start from trials. They usually start from like small 
kind of part of their, for example, in our case, it's franchise business. It's it's really scalable. It's they they want to scale like really fast as a, as a, as a, comparing to the uh, traditional like multi location brands. They need they can sell just franchise and scale, right? That's why for us it's two engines that we have generating new uh, mm-hmm. customers and it's an like engine of expanding into in within the account mm-hmm. and they expand in organically because they just grow franchise. Yeah. Business. Exactly. But so it's also, basically. Hmm, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So you know, when 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 discussing the numbers with with you, I, I was I was uh, fascinated to hear that um, as as the company grows, I, I would say probably eighty percent of uh, of the new revenue that 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 you add uh, or the revenue that you that you create uh, each month is not new sales, but recurring uh, revenue or expanded revenue, correct? Correct, correct, yeah. Uh, and and, uh, and it, it comes at a, at, at a little cost. Once you have landed, uh, the, the, the expansion is is, uh, is nicely scalable. It's organic. It doesn't take too much of, uh, of sales effort. It takes maybe some customer success management effort, but it is a rather smooth thing, right? Yes, exactly. For for enterprise customer, it's the hardest part, you know, to purchase the product, to purchase a new vendor, right? It's like a lot of legal stuff, like contracts, a lot of trust and credibility to build a relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But when you did that, so you can start providing, and if you have this kind of strategy, uh, like we have, so we're trying to scale this, we were like social media management platform, like five years ago, right? Now we are a local marketing platform because we added another channels like reviews management and managing Google uh, business profiles, Google Maps, right? So not just social media. So we added a lot of new things that we actually upsell. We're not just added for free, Mm -hmm. right? We we upsell that. And they uh, like like that because they already have a relationship with this vendor and they have with one interface and one dashboard and from like one legal entity, everything, right? So, and I think it's 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 a good strategy, especially because it's really hard to acquire new customers, right? Mm, especially the, the, the corporate customers that are really really hard. Um, Vadim, what is your experience? I'm I'm curious to hear what what your experience is on land and expand. Uh yeah, uh sure. So uh, with land and expand, probably. Um, in our case, let me, yeah, I mean, we have a couple of examples. Uh, yeah, uh, that, I mean, with enterprise, for example, we, I mean, we, because we have also an in-store version of our solution that helps sales reps to scan customers. Customers don't need to use fitting rooms. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we recently expanded within, to enterprise the customers, it's very important that you have a vari- kind of the pricing structure that is that allows you to wait to maximize your value and the, the revenue up upside when you expand, right? And we did it, we adjusted it so that it depends on a number of stores that are using our technology and the install version of, I mean, I mean the install version of, of our product. So that's why, yeah, we and that, and yes, it costed us. I mean, we didn't spend any marketing budget for that. We didn't need to go to any conferences. Uh, we just uh, developed, we nurtured the relationship with the champion, with the buyer inside the enterprise. Definitely, it's very important. I mean, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes investment in the in the in, in the relationship. And at first, you need to grow this ba- client base. But at the same time, it's very, I mean, and I think you cannot just count on it as a main revenue growth driver, but it's a very nice addition to it. And especially now when you fundraise, it's very important metric. Now it's your net revenue retention, even more important than ever before. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I would like to ask Alex, who's, who's more into the SMB part of, of the market, whether land and expand is also valid for, for his businesses. Alex. Uh-huh. Yeah, you are absolutely right. It's a uh, thing that works uh, in SMBs as well. Um, first of all, it's uh, it's quite often it's easier to acquire uh, smaller 
smaller project from uh, from a family of projects, uh, and then to to expand in this way. Uh, even uh, if you work on a mid-size or uh, over companies, uh, they still, uh, especially on new markets, when you don't you don't have any renown, uh, you will have to prove uh, that you are trustworthy business, and uh, quite often you start with uh, so-called POCs or uh, proofs of uh, concept or proof of value with smaller brand. Uh, out of a family of brands or with some region uh, of uh, of a brand. It's quite a common story that you start, for instance, with a smaller brand in Slovakia, but gradually you get 20 brands in 20 countries. And uh, yeah, so it, it works absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to adjust your, your product and your marketing approach to identifying those land expand opportunities and then deliver, huh? Very, very good. Uh, we move to uh, the, the fifth and, and, and last thesis, where I am very curious to, to, to hear about this absolutely crucial uh, element: um, how to scale, um, how to scale your your uh, your sales force. And, and uh, I found this this graph here. It's it's from PipeDrive, so that's a company that is friendly, befriended with Promo Republic in in Finland, as far as I, I know. And I think it shows nicely, you know, it takes time, you seed. And and first, uh, it's a cactus, right? It's a cactus, it doesn't make any any fruit. It's uh, very hard. Maybe you, your salespeople are also like cactuses, right? So they, uh, they're they difficult, uh, difficult to manage. But if you do it right, uh, the cactus grows and at uh, some stage it will uh, start uh, creating um, the, the flowers. So how, uh, Vadim, I, I'll ask you, how did you manage to uh, to grow uh, your your sales force and, and get it in, into uh, into shape that makes repeatable and planable uh, sales? Because I think this is the biggest experience all of you uh, had. Uh, it might look good when you when you hire uh, somebody. You might. Uh, hit the home run here, here and there. But uh, what you really need is repeatable, planable, predictable sales. So, Vadim, how 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 far are you in this process? What did you do to to get to some degree of uh, planable and repeatable sales? Please. Yeah, what is interesting in our case, it was still, that still the major part of our new business comes through in, in, in through inbound channels because we're pretty we do pr- 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 we do pretty well. Uh, on uh, with content marketing, with the thought leadership, with all the awards, conferences, ratings, etc. That's why these enterprise clients they find us, and that's why we don't we didn't need like a real field. I would say in sales executive account executives until 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 mid last year, and and we started to experiment where we hired. So I had two uh, kind of. Uh, wrong hires when I try to hire VP sales, and then just we realized at that point, at that point of time, we just didn't need them so much. And so, uh, so having said that, I, I mean, in ter- we, I mean, I still, I, I, I don't have a lot of experience to share yet in terms of b- building an account executive team in the in the US. We have BDRs who conduct demos after people. Sign up. I mean, not sign up, but just uh, send the, the 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 request. And then my co-founder Whitney, who is chief commercial o- officer, she closes like the enterprise deal. So this is how it works now. We decided to to, to keep it lean, and we plan to start scaling it later. But now we understand what kind of sales people we need. So hopefully this time we will do it right. Okay. There's still a lot of. Sounder-led, uh, sounder-led sales in your in, in your in your example. Val, uh, probably you are a bit further down down uh, down uh, the process. What what has, has, what have your pivotal experiences been? You know the failures and the successes in in, uh, in building up uh, processes that deliver predictable, somewhat predictable and planable sales. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I mean, I think this is the toughest topic, actually. Like, uh-huh. however, that's why it's the cactus, you know. That's, yeah, it's cactus, definitely. It's like necess- ne- necessary evil, right? You, you need to hire them, salespeople. And uh, they actually, the right salespeople are like super effective, right? They they can build relationship with uh, 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 with customers. They can close deals. They can expand even deals, right? They can do a lot of stuff. They can help you validate your ideas, do customer development, right? But to find, I mean, my experience, we, we, we like invested a lot of money in different roles, like HDR, account exec, even like uh, VP sales. Right, and uh, we learn a lot from from these hires, and we did some sales. Uh, but uh, before, I mean, like it's it's all like a, a lot of luck. Either you find someone who can do that and scale it, and it should be in the right moment. So my my conclusion should be in the right moment. So better to hire salespeople when you when you have playbook, when you already know how to sell. You mm-hmm. did it yourself or with your team. You did it like mm-hmm. five sell, five demos, I don't know, per, per week. You close one deal. You have conversion funnel. And wh- when you have that, you can really demand that from people that you hire. Yeah, you can kind of replicate the process. Huh? You can ask them to replicate. Yeah, it's really hard to do that with them, to test the whole funnel and mm-hmm. the product market fit or even like, sales marketing because it's like you probably could be good but how to sell that you still need to figure out and uh yeah you you, you need to do that yourself uh because it's this is the way how you can save money basically or you do that with uh, first hires and you definitely will fire them mm-hmm. uh, because yeah. they will not believe in what they're doing for salespeople in us it's super important to really know that what they're doing is actually before them or in parallel with them doing somebody else. So yeah. they don't have ob- like objections in this way, right? So they just need to do deliver their quota. And if they're not delivering quota, they know. They they're fired. Yeah, in the US, it's pretty tough. It's like if you're not delivering quota, you just fire. That's it. It's like, and you need to, they know that during even first month's trial, you need to deliver yeah. 50% of quota. And second month, you need to deliver like 100% of quota, depending on sales cycle and all this stuff. But before we learn all this stuff, we we spend like a lot of investment, yeah. several hundred. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, Alex, your 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 thoughts on 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 uh, scaling sales? Uh, well, first of all, it was uh, really uh, interesting and intriguing for me to listen what the well uh, said, because uh, they are obviously far uh, far uh, forward from us. Uh, all like to be honest, all the international sales uh, we do uh, in group of founders and C level employees. Uh, our salespeople now have only success in uh, local markets. Uh, I haven't had any. Well, actually, I had uh, some hires uh, ab- abroad, but they were not successful. Let's put it like this. Uh, it was uh, okay in the wrong in the wrong country. <laughs> mm-hmm. So your so your lesson for 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 the audience is uh, to start with uh, you have to do it. The the the, the founders have to have, you know, definitely have to Bef- before we had any success even on local market. All the sales were done uh, by my uh, co-founder uh, my partner Dmitri um, or myself, and uh, that's how it started and worked. Uh, like pretty, pretty, pretty long. So like several years, all the top sales were done directly by uh, founders, even though we already have salespeople. They just, something was not, uh, we, we could not, you know, like somehow transfer our vision and our um, passion probably. Uh, maybe that's something resonating about what Well said about they don't believe in it. Uh, even if me or... Uh, or some other uh, founder brought sales. It was like not not relevant for them because, like, and uh, you play in a different league from us. So we, we we could never close this deal. Uh, so, uh, but and how we we fought that? Eventually, we 
were finding uh, new people, hiring new salespeople who were very um, uh, hungry and um, in a good sense and uh, and very uh, ambitious. Uh, and th- this uh, breed of salespeople actually uh, actually managed to to, to close. Uh, very bold and very good uh, deals just because they were very much uh, uh, confident about uh, their uh, capabilities. And so even though salespeople came to stars from uh, absolutely different interest, industries from, you know, say, sales, uh, selling uh, some uh, metal works or uh, some educational uh stuff like courses uh, but they still succeeded just because uh comparative to previous guys uh, they were very much uh hungry and uh, sales oriented so maybe maybe that that could help okay so uh i i'm i'm not rushing but but we're getting uh to a close so this is uh more of a teaser discussion that we that we have uh that we have here uh, before I, uh, I make a message about uh, EBRD, I, I would like to go back to my uh, second uh, slide. So, so uh, we're talking about Ukraine uh, ICT uh, scale-ups. Uh, the, the three um, people on the panel are, are from Ukraine. They, uh, it's, it's, uh, their business started uh, in Ukraine. What is what is your message to uh, to the audience that? Uh, is investigating or maybe even committed to to going a, a similar path uh, uh, as you. Uh, what 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 are your main uh, recommendations uh, uh, to them? Where is it realistic? To what degree is it realistic to uh, to do it? And what should we what should you keep uh, in mind as you venture out and say, okay, we really go west, we globalize. Uh, we take the step. Uh, we are committed. Vadim, what is your uh, what is your experience? Vadim is not available at this moment. It looks like uh, so. Val, please. Uh, what? How realistic is it for uh, today for Ukrainian ICT uh, scale ups or maybe uh, startups to go? West and do all the things that we discussed uh, in the panel. Yeah, I, but I, I mean, it's like it's not kind of. I mean, Ukrainian people, especially entrepreneurs, now in the not mental condition of what realistic, what not realistic. Uh, I think <laughs> we all in in the you know the condition we can do everything, right? We can we can like do everything uh, what we want. I mean, uh, uh, like, and we don't have any other. Choice. Um, choice to do right, so right. we we need to uh, like find the ways how to do sales in Europe, how to distribute our software uh, in the US, right? So any country. Uh, yeah, that's a great statement, Val. Great. That's, uh, that's to the point, Alex. Is that um, your, what's your experience? Well, uh, I would uh, agree that uh, basically. You don't have a lot of uh, options. Uh, You just have to go global uh, because uh, because that's the only proper way to to do business. Uh, You you can obviously it's really hard to stay at the local market uh, uh, from from lots of points. But the main point is uh, you have to be able to validate. Uh, your product and also to be able um, to produce a product that will have a global uh, global interest and global um, demand. And you cannot do this training on, uh, on cats uh, at home. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Final statement from, from Alex. Hey, do we have Vadim back? Is he, is he available? Vadim, are you there? No, he. I, no, he told me that he would have to go around uh, seven, sorry, uh, six p.m. Uh, Swiss time. So we thank him posthumously <laughs> that 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 uh, that he attended. So that gets me to the to the very last part of of our uh, 
a quick uh, uh, oh, I have to move our quick excursion into uh, into uh, global scaling. And the, the question that some of you in the audience will ask is, okay, this is something we have to do. Uh, we are we are ready to do it mentally, but how uh, do we do it? And and uh, is there is there some help? I know apart from from talking to your peers, like on on the talk today, and kind of a peer talk. Uh, and something I would like to uh, to introduce to you as a as an option is uh, the EBRD. So that's the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And um, for me, that's a very nice uh, channel where I can um, help, uh, where I could help so far. Um, Ukrainian ICT uh, scale-ups like uh, like eSputnik. Um, if you are um, if you are going uh, west, um, then it might be uh, an interesting option to contact uh, the EBRD office in Ukraine. Um, I will give uh, the coordinates to 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 Karina after after uh, this call. Um, if you are not uh, too big uh, in terms of uh, employees and revenue, so if you're still a small business, if you have uh, a viable uh, product, if you have some initial um, stable uh, traction uh, sales, and also very importantly, if you are a Ukraine-owned uh, business and, and don't have any toxic capital uh, in it, uh, toxic being mostly uh, uh, Russian capital, then uh, you you f fulfill the main um, preconditions for uh, EBRD to look at your uh, application. And if you apply for uh, EBRD uh, support, what you get is something like uh, one year up to two years of uh, help from a seasoned so-called uh, senior industrial advisor like myself. So I... Uh, I'm considered as a senior industrial uh, advisor. Um, you will get something like um, 40, I would say, around 40 um, days of advisory work performed by uh, the EBRD uh, person. Um, it's not only me uh, that is available as, a, as an advisor. There are other uh, seasoned, fantastic advisors that have experience uh, through their own entrepreneurship or through consultancy like myself, uh, helping uh, startups and scale-ups uh, to globalize. So um, it doesn't cost you uh, much. It doesn't co basically cost you nothing. It is a symbolic uh, amount of money that you will have to pay to the EBRD to go into uh, this uh, advisory relationship. Uh, the only thing... The cost on your side is your commitment and and making sure that uh, resources at the top level, but also other levels in the company are committed for that project, that you have clear uh, goals and that they are ready to cooperate with EBRD in a very uh, productive uh, way. So please look at the opportunity, uh, see if this is something uh, for you. Uh, I think um, this is one of those a few things that are free that are also very, very good and helpful. And uh, maybe, uh, Alexei, you can just say one word uh, on, on, on the EBRD support that you experienced. Alexei? Okay, so Alexei is not able to say something about it, but uh, you can always get in, in touch with, with Alexei. So we just concluded, concluded the EBRD project with them um, a, a week ago. It was uh, it was very helpful. The feedback was very good from uh, Alexei. So uh, please use him uh, as a reference. So I will stop sharing and give uh, give back to, uh, to Karina and maybe she will be able to say um, what uh, next steps there, uh, there could be. Karina? 
Yes, I'm right here. I think that if you're finished with the presentation, we can move to the Q&A session from the participants. So in case oh, yeah, you have please. a question, please turn off your mic and ask it to David. And to Val, who's also available for the Q&A. So do we have any questions for from the participants? Okay, it seems to be very, uh, very clear. No problem. Yeah, uh, I think that the participants will review once again the election and we'll get back to you or to us in order we can give some in additional insights on all of those topics that you have managed to highlight. So okay. once again. Yes, thank you, thank you Karina. And, and I think for, for the participants, yeah. uh, one thing they could, uh, they, they, uh, could or, or should do is think, oh, is, is this EPRD um, advisory a good, uh, good idea for, for me? And if so, uh, I would ask them to contact uh, Karina first. Uh, we'll we'll uh, collect any, any, any interest uh, and, and then um, close the contact uh, with me and I will get in, in, in touch with you and give you some, some inputs on what you could achieve, what you could not achieve, what you could expect, not expect. And then uh, take it uh, take it from there. But please consider that uh, opportunity is really worth it. Definitely. So please, in case you want to use it, and we highly recommend you to uh, reach out to me or to the Ukrainian Startup Fund, and we'll be happy to think what we can do together. And at this point, I would like to thank David and all of our co-hosts for all of your time and knowledge and your experience that you have shared with us today. And of course, our audience for their wish to know more. I think this is it. So see you and good luck with you, SF. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, the other uh, panelists who already left. Uh, thank you, participants. Um, wish you a lot of uh, success and uh, you are uh, part of, of, uh, of the future of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, David. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.